I'm Angela Kavner, the Executive Director of CAI. I would like to welcome all attendees and thank our presenters, the Board of Directors and CAI team for creating today's program. A few announcements. Uh, today, uh, our next Wednesday webinar, sorry, uh, will be Wednesday, August 19th. Our next Cyber Trivia is, will be August 25th. And registration for all programs and details can be found on our website. A few housekeeping rules today. All participants will be muted. Please type your questions into the question box. Please be sure to state the panels that you would like your question directed to. If you need a certificate for manager credits, please email Jackie at Jacqueline, J-A-C-L-Y-N, at C-A-I-N-J dot org. And just to note, managers, if you uh, would like a certificate, you need to stay on for the entire presentation. And I would like now to introduce Megan Elgar of the Membership Committee. Megan? Hi, everyone. Good afternoon. My name is Megan Elgard. I'm actually the manager of the administration team at the Falcon Group and a member of the CAI uh, Membership Committee. And I just wanted to open up this webinar um, with being a part of the Membership Committee to remind you all to renew your memberships for this year or even become a new member um, with the great opportunities we have this year. Um, for example, some homeowner leaders, we have CAI members can access um, to CAI and Jade's ADR program, which is a cost effective way to fulfill your association's legal, legal obligation. Um, the best community associations have the best board. They're education, educated, knowledgeable, prepared to lead their communities successfully. Um, CAI New Jersey provides a robust library of content for community leaders, as well as ongoing virtual learning opportunities, um, access to industry leaders in areas such as accounting, engineering, insurance, and legal. Um, some props for managers and management companies, access to print online directory of industry leaders to help your communities navigate during these unparalleled times, um, earn continuing education credits that are either free or at a discount counted rate, and for business partners, continue to opportunity to help um, build your brand. We're committed to helping you with platforms such as the online Zoom seminars, um, webinars providing necessary education to support your business, and um, as Angela said, networking opportunities with other industry leaders, connecting virtually. Um, the 21st, we have the HOA Family Feud. The 25th, um, the Cyber Trivia Break, so it allows you to break up the day a bit and have some fun. Um, so any questions, feel free to um, visit our site or reach out to myself, any of us, and we'll help you renew your membership or even become a new member. Um, thank you again and enjoy this great seminar. Thank you, Megan. Of course. All right. Now we're going to start with Jeff. Jeffrey Surratt, uh, Esquire, is an attorney and trial lawyer representing numerous community associations throughout New Jersey and New York. Formerly a partner at a major New, New Jersey law firm, Mr. Surratt co-founded Curcio Merzion Surratt LLC in 2015 and serves as the chair of the firm's community associations practice group. Mr. Surratt will be discussing various methods to amend community associations governing, do, governing documents. Topics will include minor amendments to full to full scale restaurant reinstatements in associations entire set of governing documents. Typical master deed declaration and bylaw amendments provisions will be discussed, as well as applicable statutes and recent changes in law, law regarding amendments. Welcome, Jeff. Hi, thank you. Again, I'm Jeff Surratt. Um, I'm a lawyer that handles uh, condos, community associations. Been doing this for too many years at this point. Um, so the, uh, the topic that they've asked me to discuss is amendments to documents. So I'm going to take a few minutes and go over a couple of different ways that that could be done. Um, there's been some recent changes, uh, nothing uh, that hasn't really been around for a while. Um, just sort of made that at least one new process available and um, whether or not it was in your governing documents. So uh, the first thing that you to, to really think about is you have a, a few different uh, sets or hierarchies of authority, and it's important to, to understand those. Uh, the law, New Jersey or federal law, trumps anything that's in your master deed or declaration in your bylaws or your rules. So the law is always the, the first and the highest set of authority. And then would come your foundational document, which for a condominium is typically called the master deed. Uh, for homeowners associations, it's often called uh, declaration, but those are really 
uh, synonymous or, or, or similar documents. And then uh, under either a condominium or homeowners association, as a as a exhibit or schedule even to the master deed or declaration, you'll have a set of bylaws. The the master deed and declaration is the next highest in the hierarchy of authority. So you have the law always trumps everything. Then you have the master deed or declaration, then the bylaws, and then you go into your rulemaking, um, which would be resolutions or any rules or a handbook. Um, a resolution is really just a rule um, that's uh, been highlighted in, into its own resolution, but it has no greater authority. So if there's ever any type of uh, conflict or disagreement between any of the, the provisions of those various documents, you follow the hierarchy of authority. Um, so what you get a lot of times is you'll read something in your master deed or bylaws, um, but there might have been a law change that, uh, or there might be additional things in the law that aren't reflected there. And it's really, uh, at that point, you, you kind of need to consult with an attorney because there may be no other way to know that those things exist. So now just getting to the to the point at hand, so, so how do you amend these documents? Well, for amending the master deed or declaration, that's really um, typically the most difficult and that's intentional because as I said, that's the foundational document that is the substantive or most uh, the key provisions. Um, it sets forth the structure and it sets forth the, the most uh, fundamental aspects of the entire project. The most sets of governing documents will place a very high threshold uh, typically around 67 or sometimes higher, 75% of the members might need to agree to change that document. And, and that makes sense because you don't want that to be easy. Um, then when you get down to the bylaws, the bylaws is really the detail. So a master deed might say that you have a, a five person board that is going to act as the governing body, but it's the bylaws that say, okay, there's five people, but here's what they are. You have a president, a vice president, and here's all the things that they do. <coughs> Excuse me, I have a cough, it's not COVID, I was tested yesterday. So uh, you can't get that through electronic transmission anyhow, so you should all be just fine. Uh, but my whole family's quarantining me anyhow. What could you do? So the getting back to it, if you have a master deed that'll have these basic provisions and then you have the rules and the bylaws and then going down even further to the rules and regulation uh, to flesh these things out. So how do you amend the bylaws? How do you amend the master deed rather the declaration? You really have to follow the provision <clears throat> excuse me, you have to follow whatever the provision is in the master deed or declaration. And there's really no easy way to get around that. Um, most of the law that I'm going to discuss really uh, refers to the bylaws. Uh, there are various and much easier ways to amend bylaws these days, but the master deed and declaration, typically um, you're going to, um, you're going to have a meeting and it runs very similar to an election. So here's, the, the best way to, to deal with a master deed or, or amendment would be really just to send, just, just the way that you would an election, you send out the proposed change, you give people a proxy and absentee ballot, and, and, and eventually you, you can hold the meeting. Now, it, it is okay to see how many you got back and then adjourn the meeting for a month or two and then put out another mailing if you think you need more support. Because once you have the meeting, if you don't get the votes, you got to start over. So you, you try to make sure that you have good support for that. To amend the bylaws is much easier. To amend the bylaws, you could follow the process that's in the bylaws, <coughs> excuse me, which is usually very similar to the, the process in the master deed, but often has a lower threshold. So it might be similar to an election where you send out the notice of whatever the proposed bylaw amendment is along with a proxy and an absentee ballot, and you can conduct the same process, but very often it's a simple majority or 50%. But there are other statutory methods that you can use to amend the bylaws that are much easier. The one that everybody's talking about now is a recent change to the law that allows what, what we refer to as a negative ballot process or a negative amendment, meaning the board can on its own without consulting with the community can actually vote to amend the bylaws. And then they send out notice of this amendment with a rejection ballot. And if 10% or more of the community rejects the amendment that the bylaw that the board adopted, then it fails. After 30 days, if they did not receive 10% or more rejection ballots, then it succeeds, it gets recorded and you can enforce it. <coughs> Excuse me. The, the other way, which has been around um, really as long as I've been a lawyer, but very few uh, attorneys and practitioners that I've seen use, and I, I've used it since day one, is something I call the consent procedure, similar to a petition. 
there's a, a, a statute called the New Jersey Nonprofit Corporation Act, and it has a provision that states that you can anything that you have to do in a meeting pursuant to the bylaws, you can do without having a meeting as long as you have the written consent of the minimum number of people that you would have needed in order to conduct the meeting. What does that mean in English? That means you need a quorum to have a, a meeting. So say a quorum is in your community, 25 people. <coughs> Excuse me, if you get 25 people to sign, I agree to the following amendment, then you can send out a notice pursuant to the statute. It's a 10 day notice that says the, the re required number of people signed a consent to amend the bylaws. And, after, and there's no rejection ballot, no other, it's just a notice. And after 10 days, if nobody ran to court and tried to stop it, then you could uh, go ahead and record that and it's effective. Now, the for the first method, which is going through the, the same way as an election, you need the, to have the highest number of people participating. The second method is just the board adopting it and, you'll, and only 10% can reject. And the third method, you just need to hit the minimum quorum requirement. <coughs> I'm sorry. So those are the, the three basic methods to amend the bylaws. And to me, it's much easier because using those other two methods, the consent procedure and the rejection ballot procedure, it, it's really very simple, uh, especially the consent procedure because you can hold it open for a year or two years and just walk around and, and get it. It's like getting people to sign a petition. Once you hit the number, you're good to go. It's very easy. Um, on the rejection um, method, 10% 10, 10 is often a very low number. So for instance, if you only have 50 units, you know, you, it's very, 10% 10, 10 is just a couple of people. If they reject it, you can't get it through that way. Um, so sometimes that's effective and sometimes it isn't. And we really have to look at what you're doing and the level of support or opposition to decide which method to use. And then of course, amending rules and regulations is very simple. That's just the board does whenever at the board's uh, discretion. So with those, uh, using those methods, you can amend your documents now. These, these different methods apply whether you're doing one or two amendments or you're changing the whole set from scratch. So there are times when you just want to do a couple of spot amendments, and there may be times when you want to just throw the whole thing out and start over. <coughs> it's important to note if you are doing a whole restated set of documents, if, um, if you want to follow the procedure that's in the master deed or declaration, and you would not be changing ownership or percentage of ownership interest, because to do that, you would need 100% unanimity. But to change all of the other provisions, you could do that following whatever the threshold is that's set forth in the governing documents. So those are the basic methods to, uh, to change uh, or modify your bylaws. And uh, with that, if you'd like to um, go over to the Q&A, if anybody had any question, that's, um, th those are the legal ways to get there. Okay, I have a question here. Um, do bylaw changes need to be registered with local government? And what was method three? If you can re repeat that. Certainly, method method three is called the consent procedure, and it is um, allowed pursuant to the New Jersey Nonprofit Corporation Act. And the way that works in English is whatever your quorum requirement is to conduct the meeting, if you get that number of people to sign a document that says, I consent to the following amendment, with that, you can move forward to, towards recording. <coughs> Excuse me. In order to make a uh, the amendment effective, it does have to be recorded, and that's at the county level. And that's something your attorney generally will handle for you after you've met the required um, vote. Whether whether you use any of the different procedures, whatever if, if you had a meeting, whenever the meeting occurred, if you followed the consent procedure and you gave your 10-day notice, or you followed the rejection procedure and you got you sent out your 30-day notice, at those times. The last thing that's done is the lawyer will record the document with the county. It'll get a book and page stamp, and then it will be mailed out to everyone. And at that moment, um, it's when it goes into effect. Okay, great. Um, next question. Uh, when is it appropriate to do a few amendments, and when is it appropriate complete to, re to restate the governing, doc governing documents? Generally, if the documents are, are more than about 10 or 15 years old, we start looking at just redoing them because a lot has changed. And, not only has it changed from the law's perspective, but just in practitioner's understanding of, of how to how to do things. Um, when Even when I went to law school, which is getting to be a while ago at this point, there, everything was in English. It's no more Latin. It, it's We're not trying to be overly intellectual just to confuse you. Um, we've gotten, in, in person, I've gotten a lot better at crafting documents that are uh, usable for non-lawyers and very easy to read. So as the, the older you get with the documents, 
the more right they are for a full scale revision. Um, but really, if you're doing, if there's only four or five things that are really important, you might save some money by just hitting those things. Um, so that's, that's really a determination that gets made in consultation with the lawyer. And it would have to do with your finances. Um, and, you, you know, to undertake a full scale revision is, it's a long process and it takes a lot of work from the board because they have to read the whole thing in several re, uh, versions of it. So it's really a matter of uh, how old the documents are, what, how, what kind of shape they're in and um, how much time and energy the board has to devote to a full scale amendment. Um, if, if you don't have the funds or the time, we'll throw a couple just spot fixes in and try to just get you, get you through until you can get to, to a good rewrite. Okay, we have another question. <laughs> Excuse me. Oh, where did it go? Hold on a second. We just lost it. One second. Okay. Uh, we finished transition last year and we want to clean out all the referrals to builder to builder plus tweak some bylaws and add a few new a few new. Is this still bylaws driven or a declaration as well? And do we need a lawyer very familiar with Radburn now? Well, you definitely need a lawyer that's familiar with everything. Radburn is just one thing. I don't think it's particularly you know, uh, significant, meaning there's only a few things in the new amendment that really has to do with this. And in terms of the rejection method, that's something I've been writing into documents for 15 years or more. It just now became codified in law. So now it, you could use that process, whether it's in the documents or not, but it's a procedure I've, I've used and, um, and amended into documents for going back for years. Um, it, the In terms of, making amendments, you have to amend the provisions where they're located. So if the provision is in the master deed that you're looking to change or delete, then you have to amend the master deed. If the provision you're looking to change or delete is in the bylaws, you have to change or amend the bylaws. So if you're looking to get rid of the developer or sponsor, which is not necessary, but I understand why you wanna do it, wherever those, those are located, that's what you have to fix. Great, and I think there's one last question. When can amendments be enforced and can we can they be retroactive? So once they're recorded and they were sent out to everybody, published, which means that you told people about it, that okay, this, this is adopted, it's now been recorded, and here's the recorded copy, that's when you start to enforce it. As far as retroactive, you, you can't apply a fine retroactively. You know, if, if somebody did something and it wasn't a violation, you can't adopt the rule and then say that they're in violation. <laughs> Excuse me, but what you can do for certain things is you could start applying something. So for instance, say you, you tell everybody that front doors have to be black. Okay, so now you put in these new provisions that the front doors have to be black, and whether that's a rule change or an amendment, uh, depending on what your documents currently say as to what, where that would fit in. Once that goes into effect, you can say, okay, you have 90 days to do it, or you have 180 days to do it. You can't say they were in violation, but you can then give them some time to, to come into compliance. There are certain things that you can't just because of case law. For instance, if you would do an amendment that says no dogs, and then you can't make somebody get rid of a dog that was brought into the community lawfully because you change the rules later because there's case law that says you can't. And in terms of what you can apply that way and what you can't, you got to ask a lawyer because that's really reflected throughout a whole myriad of cases. There's also a doctrine um, of acquiescence. Um, which is if something has been ignored, if a bylaw provision hasn't been enforced for so long, and as a result, there, there's such a pervasive change in the character of community. For instance, if there was a no dog policy and 95% of the people had dogs for 20 years and nobody said anything, you might find um, judges that say, well, you can't enforce that anymore. It's, the change is so pervasive that it's essentially been waived, but that is such a rare occurrence and there's, really the board is able to effectuate whatever change it wants and they're able to apply it from that point forward for most things, but you can't violate somebody, some, somebody for doing something that was okay when they did it with the later amendment. Okay, thank you. Thank, thank you, Jeff. You. Those, are all, those are all questions. Thank you so thank much. You. Thank you. Okay, uh, next up, uh, Ed Small. Ed Small is one of four GAF territory managers who cover the state of New Jersey. He has been with GAF for almost 10 years, and he will be discussing roofing materials. Welcome, Ed. Good afternoon. Uh, th thank you for having me. Um, 
what I wanted to, to cover today was, uh, you know, GAF is, is known for having uh, a roof shingle, an asphalt roof shingle out there that uh, goes under the name of Timberline or Timberline HD. And coming into this year, GAF has, has made some improvements to that shingle uh, without changing the appearance of it or the color, color palette or anything like that. So I just wanted to talk to you about um, some of the changes and, and uh, how it will affect uh, your job sites. So our new Timberline shingle, we've added a Z to the name, so now it's called Timberline HDZ. And if you look at the picture there, you, you'll see that uh, there's two white lines there, which we call the strike zone or the nail zone. So the gap there is 1.88, 1.81 inches wide, uh, just shy of two inches. And what we tell the roofer today is that all you have to do is put the nail in between those lines and that'll keep the, the shingles in place uh, uh, for the warranty. Um, in the past, we only had one line there and it was a real narrow area for the roofer uh, to put the nails. So we did this by uh, basically uh, using today's technology and improving the uh, manufacturing process of how the shingles are actually put together. Um, in the past, you know, you have the top part of the shingle, uh, which we call the dragon tooth, and then the bottom part of the shingle that we call the backer. And when they were put together, they were basically put together with adhesive. Well, today we still use the adhesive, but we also use this uh, mechanically fused process, which, you know, when the shingles are going through the machine, um, there's this punch that's created, which creates a, a monolithic bond. So there's there's areas throughout the shingle where it's actually where the two, the top and the bottom are fused together into one shingle. So uh, the next slide is a video I wanted to show you just to, to give you a, an update, uh, a brief overview. Snoop. Is the volume not working? And the volume's not going to work actually for videos that are on your computer. I'm sorry. Oh. Okay, well, we'll just let it play. Okay, so very sorry about that, um, but just a couple of, of, of the highlights there. So what's happening with the shingle is, you know, we have the wider nail line for the strike zone for the roofer, um, and one of the benefits of that of that is that, especially on multifamily jobs where you have these long longer runs, they should be able to install uh, the shingles a little bit quicker uh, than they have in the past. And it's much more easier for them to, to uh, get the nails right uh, uh, in the strike zone. Another benefit to it is that uh, when the shingles are now put together with this, with this monolithic bond that I was talking about, uh, we've been able to uh, improve the time that it takes for the shingles to, uh, to uh, adhere to, to one another or to the, to the roof deck. So in the past, uh, you know, it would take 
maybe six, seven, eight hours for the shingles to start the, to stick together. Um, with this new process, uh, it's closer to four hours. So we're anticipating that when, when shingles are put down into colder weather, they're going to adhere quicker and uh, there's less chance for any blow-offs in the, uh, in the cold, colder, cooler, cooler months. You see this wind-proven logo here now. Uh, another benefit to this new shingle, this new and improved shingle, is that we've been able to enhance our wind warranty. So in the past, uh, most shingles have 130 mile an hour wind warranty. With this new process, this new manufacturing process, we've taken away the limit uh, and we call it a, a no maximum uh, wind limitation uh, to our shingle. So, um, you know, that's just further proof how GAF is uh, going to stand behind the product uh, and how it's going to, going to uh, work for us uh, in the wintertime. Go ahead, Sully. Next. Uh, so that's the, shing that's the shingle. Uh, I just wanted to touch on the, on, uh, the warranties. So what we're showing you here is the uh, standard warranty that comes with every uh, bundle of shingles for multifamily uh, developments. The first 10 years, it's covered uh, at 100% against manufacturing defects. Um, so that means that if there's a, a manufacturing problem in the first 10 years, GAF will pay the roofer fair and reasonable rate at the time to go back and fix that problem. After year 10, uh, the coverage begins to prorate, uh, very similar to you know what you would see with a car tire that has a you know 50,000 mile uh, warranty. So what you're seeing there is is your standard warranty. Now a lot of times uh, we have an upgraded warranty uh, that gets used a lot in the multifamily business, and we call that our Golden Pledge warranty. The difference between the Systems Plus warranty and the Golden or the standard warranty and the Golden pledge warranty is that golden pledge warranty that you're looking at here takes that 10 year coverage out to 40 years against material defects and and then what we do uh, for the workmanship is that we also cover the 20, the 20 years so a golden pledge warranty can only be installed by one of our what we call a master elite contractor and those folks are required to have certain uh, insurances. They go through certain testing uh, every calendar year. Um, we uh, train them on how, how the roof sh should be installed. Uh, because of that, we're covering their workmanship for 20 years uh, on how they install the shingle. So the warranty uh, um, that I wanted to, to, to stress to you is that the warranty is between uh, the community and GAF. You know, our goal is that the, our hope is that the roofer will become a millionaire and move to the Bahamas and we can't find them. But when there's a, uh, when there's a warranty issue, you know, in this case, GAF is in Parsippany, New Jersey. We're a local company and uh, uh, we would still cover the warranty whether the roofer's around or, or, or not. Um, so that's the difference between a standard warranty and a golden pledge warranty. The golden pledge covers the guy's workmanship and extends out the uh, the material defect part of it. Sully. So that's it. Um, I just wanted to cover with you how we uh, we improved the shingle, uh, how the wind proven warranty uh, is now in place, and the differences between the standard warranty and the golden pledge warranty, which. Uh, which is used a lot uh, with the multifamily uh, developments. Thank you, Ed. Uh, there are a couple of questions. Uh, the first one: uh, We are a firewise community. How does this rate? How does the shingle rate? You are a what community? Firewise. 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 So, yeah, I would imagine against fire. So, there is, are there any fire ratings? I would imagine they're asking. So the, these are Class A rated fire shingles, uh, class A rated shingles. Okay. Um, uh, the other question related to current roofing, have you heard of a rice in increase or 
Strike and sheathing. And does that make any sense to you? D-R-I-C-O-N. What is it? Oh, is that, uh, is that supposed to be price increase? Yeah, no, I think they're not. talking about for DRICON, for the fire retardant treated plywood. DRICON, D-R-I-K-O-N, sheathing? Yeah, I don't know if that would be a question for um, for GAF, but, but I can yeah, certainly answer that. Go ahead, yeah. Steve. Yeah, we are seeing uh, cost increases for that. There's been a few things, and it's somewhat COVID-related okay. um, with the manufacturing plants not being able to produce as much material. Um, and there's shortages on plywood in general. So we are seeing that there is a uh, spike in the costs for DRICON, as well as other um, wood materials. And we're also seeing that across the industry for, for almost all materials right now. It, including roofing. Yeah. Um, you know, anything in the home improvement business or building industry is having issues with production and getting raw materials. And there are price increases on just about every, everything that goes on on a house these days. Okay. Um, is this a nation, a national wide program? I would imagine the warranty they talked about. Oh, the warranty, yes. Yep, uh, GA, GAF uh, sells shingles across the United States. Uh, we're a global company. We're headquartered in Parsippany, New Jersey. Um, but regarding the United States, yeah, we have uh, well, I think it's 14 or 15 uh, manufacturing facilities. Okay. And the last question, can you, can you confirm the qualifications the contractor needs in order to uh, offer the warranties? So to offer the, uh, the Golden Pledge warranty, he has to be in our what we call a master elite program. So that means he, he's carrying a million dollars worth of insurance. He's been in business for a number of years. He participates in uh, mandatory training that we do uh, every calendar year. Uh, sometimes it's repetitive, but you know we make them go through it because we cover uh, certain areas uh, of the roof of how a valley gets done or drip edge or a cricket or all kinds of things. And uh, like I was saying, GAF is responsible for that warranty so we want to make sure and we want to train them that they're doing it the way we want it done. You know, and, and you know, Steve from Falcon is, is, uh, is on this call. He's very familiar with, uh, with what we put these guys through and, and, you know, we stop in and we talk with Steve's group uh, once or twice a year to make sure uh, we're all on the same page. Yeah, it's a nice thing to have because at least you know that um, and we require it on our specifications that the contractors have that certification for those very reasons because you're kind of making sure that you've got somebody that's got experience working with a lot of different roof systems that they've gone through the proper training with GAF and that they have that certification so that we're making sure that we're putting out our specifications to bid to contractors that we're going to feel comfortable working with. Right. Okay. Uh, let me see. Uh, yeah, that's it. Thank you very much, Ed. Sure, thank, thank you. you thank you. Okay. All right, now Steve Lang. Steve is Executive Vice President and Architect with the Falcon Group. He is involved with the firm's architecture and engineering projects. Steve is responsible for overseeing townhome and condominium building envelope work in the state of New Jersey. Steve will be discussing roof engineering with us today. Welcome, Steve. Hi, thank you. Um, yes, I'm Steve Lang, I'm with Falcon, um, Executive Vice President with Falcon. I head up our building envelope division, uh, as Angela was saying, um, which basically means that I handle all of our roofing, siding, um, cladding type projects, window replacements on everything from uh, high rises down to townhome communities. Um, what we're going to talk about a little bit today is just some roofing quick takes, um, just a general overview of, of different roof systems and then a few different um, pointers for you guys to take home. So we're going to keep it on a very high level because um, it's very brief. We only have 10, 15 minutes or so to discuss. Um, so if anybody has any questions, we'd be happy to talk to you uh, or either answer them at the end of the presentation or offline. Um, so basically, the first point that we want to make is what is a roof? It's 
It's part of the shelter portion of um, buildings that we live in. It's protecting the building and the inhabitants from the elements. Um, so we need it to function like that. We, we have to make sure that it's gonna be watertight, that you're not gonna allow um, leaks to occur that are gonna impact the residents and the quality of the inside of the buildings. Um, different types of roof systems that we have. Uh, there's steep slope roofing, um, which obviously we talked a little bit about the HDZ sh uh, shingles from GAF. Uh, that would fall under this classification. That's going to be roofs that go from uh, 2 inches and 12 all the way up to uh, a 12 and 12 pitch. Um, so those are going to be the more traditional uh, roof systems that you're going to see like asphalt shingles, metal panels, slate, uh, cedar shakes, and terracotta. So a lot of, the, if you live in a town community, you're probably very familiar with these types of systems. There's also low slope roofing, um, which is, uh, we don't necessarily call it flat roofing, even though the pitches can be pretty much flat. Uh, we typically like to see a little bit of a slope or a pitch, just so we're making sure that we're draining those roofs as well. So you're gonna see anything from a, um, a quarter inch uh, in 12 to uh, up to about that, that two and 12 range. So it's just everything that's below what the steep slope roofs are gonna cover. Uh, these types of systems, you're gonna have your EPDM roofing, you're gonna have your, your TPO, um, your asphalt built up type roofing products, and now they're coming out with liquid and fluid applied systems, uh, newer technology. So we're seeing a lot of advancements in the low slope roof systems. The big differences in the keys that we wanna just uh, make you guys aware of here is that um, what the function of these roofs are supposed to do. With a steep slope roof and with asphalt shingles, you're basically um, lapping them and it's not completely waterproof. The intent is that with that lapping, you're gonna shed water off of those roofs. With a low slope roof system and having a much lower pitch, uh, we really need that system to be uh, waterproof because you're gonna have areas where you may get ponding water for periods of time. So that's, that's the key differences. Uh, a steep slope roof is not completely waterproof. It's gonna allow it, that roof system to breathe a little bit, uh, but you're gonna be uh, shedding that water off uh, where a low slope roof system is gonna be completely uh, water impermeable. So the building code is gonna have some basic minimum requirements for uh, a roof system. They're gonna give you the, uh, the, the, the bare minimum of what you have to have and what you have to conform to. And the building code actually references the manufacturer's installation instructions. Um, so they're gonna point you back to that. So if, if you're installing a product and the manufacturer requires something, then you have to conform to that requirement and it's basically falling under, underneath the code. So one of the things that we'll get asked quite a bit is why do we need a design professional? Um, and I just put some points together here for you. Again, the building code is gonna set up your minimum requirements. It's not gonna account for site specific issues, building specific details that may come up um, it may not cover all aspects of what you need on your specific building. Um, the building inspectors, they're going to conduct very limited observations. Um, they're going to come out usually at the end of the project and see the work is completed. And that's basically the, their inspection checklist. They have no liability. So if anyone um, that's on this call is going through transition or um, seeing what can happen during transition, a question that will often come up is if there's an existing defect hey, can we go back to the building department? They inspected this. Uh, could we essentially sue them? Is there any liability there? And the answer is no. Uh, so they've got no liability, no skin in the game. And again, they're conducting very limited observations. They have a lot of different buildings that they have to look at. So it's very difficult and challenging for them to pick up site-specific issues that can come up. The manufacturers are getting, again gonna have uh, their typical installation requirements. Again, these are not site-specific or region-specific. They're gonna have to cover the entire country. So GAF has their installation guides and it's going to cover essentially the entire United States. Um, and that's the guidebook that we're going to follow. So when you're in the Northeast, you may have some very specific challenges that are different than if you were in Florida or in California. So you want to make sure that you're, you're paying attention to your region specific requirements and, and things that may need to get built into your design. The contractors um, we'll often see that they're hired to perform a very specific scope of work. I've gone out on projects and a community's hired a contractor to replace their roofs and there's issues that come up after the fact. And the reason being is that they were asked to replace the roofs because they were having what they thought were leaks, but really it was an issue with blaze guard or a ventilation problem or something to do with the siding or somewhere else. And if you're hiring that contractor, they're basically um, doing what you're asking them to do. They're replacing that roof and that's really all that they're looking at. 
it's not their role to go out and identify existing conditions or deficiencies that you may need specialized details for. So you want to make sure that you're understanding that and that you're you're protecting yourself and that you're getting um, really a system that's going to be able to cover all of your needs. Some common issues that, that can come up that we often see, especially in steep slope roofing, um, you do get this a little bit in low slope roofing, is, ventilate, is inadequate ventilation. Um, if, you're, if your roof is not adequately ventilated, it can lead to issues like ice damming, condensation, it can void certain um, uh, manufacturer warranty requirements. Uh, GAF, for example, has very specific requirements. They want you to make sure that you're providing the code required ventilation within your, your building. A lot of the buildings that we're working with in communities, they're older, they're, they're 25, 30 years old, and now they have to replace the roofs. They may not have had that, that appropriate ventilation, the code required ventilation when they were originally constructed. We weren't really paying as much attention to it, or at least the builders weren't back 25, 30 years ago. And now we're seeing that there can be all kinds of issues that come from this. So we want to make sure that we're correcting those issues as part of any roof replacement project uh, for a variety of reasons. Again, to make sure that we're preventing ice damming, issues with condensation, that you're getting the full useful life out of the roof. If you don't have that appropriate ventilation, it can cause the shingles to age prematurely. They can dry out and then you're going to have to replace them a lot sooner. What can happen then is that if you were planning on your reserve study of replacing that roof in 30 years and all of a sudden it's year 20 and you have to replace your roofs now because they've aged quicker than everybody thought they were going to, now you have a shortfall in cash and that's not anything that any community really wants to get involved in. So again, there's a photo that just shows an example of an ice dam that you can have if you don't have um, uh, proper ventilation. So you want to make sure that you're, you're correcting these types of problems. Somebody might say that we've got, we've got leaks that are happening. It could be from an ice dam. Uh, damage that occurs because of these ice dams is also going to be voided from the, it's not included under the warranty term. So again, it's very important that you want to protect that roof system if you're replacing it and that you want to have that proper ventilation. Um, an interesting fact, at least here in New Jersey, is that the, the code, and we talked about the code minimums, the code only requires um, the, the ice barrier membrane in one county. It's Sussex County in New Jersey. So all the other places, all the other um, counties and regions that we have in New Jersey, it's not technically required by code. A lot of contractors are starting to install it now as part of a best practice thing. We require it in our specifications. But again, you don't want to go and design to the code minimum. You want to take these other things into account because we do have ice dams all throughout the state. Um, so if you're only following what the code minimum is, and if you were to technically hire a contractor and he's only required to install what the code requires, he can go ahead and replace your roof and not put an ice barrier membrane. And you really have no recourse to go uh, after him if you have uh, issues with ice damming and water infiltration from it in the future. So you want to be careful and you want to make sure that you're um, taking these things into consideration. The code does not uh, really give you the proper design that you want to have on your buildings. It's a slight increase in cost to put it in. So we definitely recommend it and we require our specifications, but again, you don't want to just go with the code minimums. Some issues that we'll see with our, our town hall communities too is the uh, architectural de detailing on the buildings. A lot of time the developers will take um, specific unit types that an architect draws up and then they'll mash them all together to create a building because they want to maximize the number of units that they have in a space. And what happens then is that we get details like this in this image where you've got different roof planes all combining into different areas. Um, if you're going out and you're just trying to replace this roof and you're hiring somebody to do that, you could have a lot of problems in the future and it doesn't necessarily mean that they did anything wrong. They could have put in everything per what the code requires and what the roof shingle manufacturer requires. This is just a poor design that we have to then work around and we've got to make improvements to and correct as part of a, a roof replacement project to avoid areas where we're going to have constricted drainage planes that go through here. If you imagine that there's a storm going on and the roof is shedding water towards that valley, um, you have a lot of water that's being directed right into a very small pinch point. You're going to have problems with your gutters there. You're going to have a lot of water that's just pooling up in there. You're going to have a lot of snow that collects in there. You really want to make sure that you've got the proper protection under there and you've got to go well above what the code minimums require and what the manufacturers require as a minimum because they're they're not designing for these types of unique conditions that you're, you could have on your site. Uh, warranties, I, I was talking about that a little bit as well. Um, you know, I'm talking a little bit more in general terms. Your, your low slope warranties, 
Um, you can typically get them to include the material and labor coverage from anywhere from 15 to 20 years. There's different requirements that you're going to have to meet those, those warranty terms. So if you want a 20 year warranty, you may have to put down a couple extra layers. You may have to put down additional protection. Um, so you want to know that in advance and you want to know that um, when you're getting bids back from contractors, you're getting apples to apples pricing. Is somebody putting down a 15 year system? Is somebody putting down a 20 year system? If you have a detailed set of specs, you call that out in advance and you can make sure that you're getting apples to apples pricing on the same systems that are going in. With the steep slope systems, um, typically you, your basic warranties aren't going to require, or if you go directly to a contractor, there's no set labor requirement on the installation deficiencies. So you might get one contractor that provides a two-year warranty or one that provides three or one that's five or one that's 10. Again, most in engineering firms in, in the state of New Jersey are going to say, hey, we're going to require that the contractor is going to give you five years against installation deficiencies, which is great. But you want to make sure that you're getting that and you may not have that protection unless you engage a professional and that it's written down somewhere that that's what they have to provide. Um, so you want to have somebody that's giving you some guidance through that. Enhanced warranties, like what Ed was talking about, the GAF offers, pretty unique within the industry, that Golden Pledge warranty. There really aren't any other shingle manufacturers that are um, putting that type of a warranty out there that can give you 40 years of total coverage, 20 years on installation deficiencies. So that's a great thing to have. Um, we, again, recommend to our clients that they at least get pricing for it. It does come at additional cost, typically, uh, anywhere from, we see, 12 to $13 an extra uh, uh, per square. Um, so again, that's something that you may want to look into. Um, some of the material warranties from different shingle manufacturers can range. Um, you might see from, from the base level ones that we would spec anywhere from 30 to 40 years, but there's differences in the coverage. Um, some of the shingle manufacturers out there might just show up and say, hey, here's a pallet of the shingles that um, we, we need to replace. See ya. And they're not actually going to include the coverage of the labor to remove the other material that was defective and to put the new material up. So you want to make sure that you're reading that fine print. Again, that's one of the things that we do see about GAF that we like, and that's a reason why we do specify their products. They do provide that additional labor coverage. But as a, as a layperson, you want to make sure that you're getting that and that you've got somebody that's in your corner to make sure that you're having the proper coverages. Because if you pick a different shingle manufacturer, you may not be getting the same, the same type of warranty. It's extremely important to keep that in mind. So again, the role of a design professional, um, make sure that you're getting the proper material specified, um, that the, the scope of work that's, that's being called out includes any ancillary scopes of work that need to be done, uh, that the detailing matches the site-specific conditions, and that you've got the right flashing in place. Uh, you can have somebody that's going to guide you through that bidding price process, again, to make sure that you're getting apples to apples uh, pricing. Doing the evaluations is something I highly recommend um, to do up front because, again, um, if the more things that you can identify before the project starts, the more that you can put it into your specifications that you can get bid out during the competitive bid phase, eliminate change orders, things like that, so unforeseen expenditures. So it's great to put that, get that evaluation done before a project begins. And then during the project, you want somebody that's going to be there to just make sure that um, the, the work that you specified is actually being implemented by the contractors. Because again, it could be that they've got a crew out there and they're used to doing things a certain way. They may not realize that they have to do things a little bit different for some site specific reasons or because you guys are paying for it. And you wanna make sure that that's getting um, taken care of. You want somebody that's gonna be there to review that the work's completed. You don't wanna put that down on a property manager or um, have somebody that's not a professional, not trained in doing this, that's authorizing those payments that any additional work, that the quantities match up, and then any field conditions that come up, you've got somebody that's in your corner again to help uh, provide direction on that. So again, with a, a shingle roof replacement, some things that you may need to consider uh, incorporating into your projects. Do you need to have your gutters and leaders replaced? A lot of times that's a good time to do it. Do you need to replace vented soffits? Um, do you wanna rewrap rakes and fascias? Do you need to have attic ventilation improvements? Are there deficiencies there that need to be addressed? Um, that need to be incorporated into the project. And again, you want to get that pricing in advance. Are you going to have to deal with skylights, satellite dishes, B vents, things like that? You really want to get a full understanding on that if you don't engage professional. These are a lot of things that might either get missed or they're going to come in and trickle in later on down the road as change orders. And you might wind up paying a lot more for it. Similarly, with low slope roof systems, you're going to have to do any um, insulation improvements, 
things like that. Uh, are there any detailing that, that needs to be corrected? Those are all things that are very important that if you're gonna spend a significant amount of money and when you're talking about uh, capital reserve study, roof replacement is a, is a large portion of what you're reserving for, you wanna make sure that it's done right. So again, having that professional in your corner um, is really gonna provide you that protection and, and, and really pay off in the long run. So that's kind of it for my presentation. Again, tried to keep it um, at a very high level just so everybody could get a, a good understanding and then maybe open up for any questions that you guys have. Uh, yeah, there are, are a couple of questions. Uh, the first, is it, um, what are your thoughts on insulate, installation of, I'm um, sorry, insulation placed in within the attic ceiling? Insulation, not insulation. Oh, I could talk about that for hours. Um, so what we'll often see now um, in, in the townhomes and in, in the communities that we work with is that you know, they were built again 30 years ago. The insulation requirements were a lot less than what we have today. And the insulation that's up in those attics, we'll, we'll often see when we're in there that they could be misplaced. It's just, you know, somebody was fixing a uh, hi hat light or working around somewhere and it's gotten moved and people have put storage up there and it's getting crushed. So um, a lot of times there's room for improvement where you could go in there and, and, and really bring that insulation up to current code requirements. You've gone from having R30 as a requirement to R49, which is almost twice as much. Um, so you can see that the, the building codes are seeing that there's a big benefit to improving that insulation. So um, that's just something to kind of keep in mind. But I do think it, it, does, um, it does provide value to the home in terms of the comfort level. Uh, because those attics are, even though we're, we're ventilating them, they're still going to be very hot in the, in the in the summertime and in the winter. They're supposed to be cold, so you're going to have some some energy loss in those areas. And and it's not expensive to do insulation improvements, engage a contractor to go out there and add some insulation. But what you want to make sure that you do is that you're not um, blocking the ventilation areas. So down at the soffits, there needs to be baffles. You got to make sure that you're maintaining that airflow. Great. Uh, one. Additional question uh, for either Ed or C. Uh, do you enjoy cleaning roofs with uh, black and mold? Roof cleaning. Um, are you talking and about and on like the outside of the area yeah. where you have? Yeah, exterior, you know, roof shingles. Yeah, on the outside. Um, yeah. Well, we often, um, we'll, we'll defer to, we have GAF has some technical bulletins on that and they provide some guidelines for materials that you can use for cleaning. The newer shingles actually have, uh, and, and Ed can probably talk about this better than I can, but they have um, materials that are actually embedded into the shingles to prevent that from happening. So some of the some of the older shingles that you have are a little bit more prone to having uh, fungal growth on them, um, and they do have cleaning methods. And basically, you want to make sure that you're not going to cause any damage. You don't want to be power washing with high pressure. It's kind of a light wash with a very light cleaning, and then there's um, some proprietary products out there that are designed to, to kill that uh, that mold and not harm the shingles that you would probably want to look into. Yeah, so I, I would say, um, so we do have a technical bulletin that, that uh, is our recommendation on how to uh, clean today's shingle that I could uh, email to you, Angela, if you wanted to pass it along. Mm -hmm. um, today's shingle uh, comes with, uh, copper copper granulars mixed into the shingle and copper is what fights the uh the algae and the issue is that the copper over time washes away or, or wears away so over the last two years gaf has started to introduce some technology into our higher end shingles where now it's not uh, not now it's not a, a copper granular but it's a copper capsule uh, more like an aspirin kind of capsule. And there's time release to these cop these copper ions that now come out. So uh, uh, the warranty on algae went from 10 years to 25 years with, with this new technology. So we call that stain guard plus. Um, it's currently on our ultra shingle and uh, on our American harvest shingle. Um, it's not on the Timberline HDZ just yet. Okay, great. Thank you. Uh, let's see. What can be done about overheating attics with new roofs? 
So um, that's that's a great question. Um, again, we want to make sure that you're getting the, the right amount of ventilation in there. So oftentimes what we'll do is we'll get into an attic space, we'll take measurements, and we'll make sure that you have the appropriate amount of, of ingress ventilation, which is the incoming air down at the lower sections of the roof, whether it be the soffits or through other um, ventilation products that are out there, um, like the GAF um, Intake Pro. And then we want to make sure that we've got the appropriate amount of egress, so exiting ventilation up at the at the ridge, and that can be a ridge vent, it could be louvers. Um, in some cases, that uh, where you can't get the appropriate amount of of ridge vent or or louver vents, you may have to look to an attic fan. That's kind of something that um, the industry has gotten away from, and we could have a whole separate um, discussion on. Um, but in some cases, you may need to have that if you can't get uh, enough ventilation. So they have calculations for it, both within the, the building codes and um, the National Roofing Contractors Association has recommendations for, for that as well um, on what the amount of ventilation that you, that you need is. And we try to make sure that we do those calculations for every community that we work with so that we're providing the appropriate amount so that we're satisfying both the building code requirements and what the shingle manufacturers want and to make those those attics functioning correctly so that the roof systems will be properly maintained. Thank you. Um, an additional question came in for Jeff. Uh, Jeff, are you with us? Yes, I am. Okay. Um, what about limiting uh, the number of rented units? How hard is it to establish and enforce that? Well, the, it has to be done with a 75% majority irrespective of anything it says in the governing documents, and that's pursuant to a statute. So this one's a little frustrating. Um, there's, it's just a very particularized statute about uh, restraints on alienation, they call it. So essentially, if you're going to limit the number of rentals, it's a high threshold. And it, it could be done, and it doesn't really matter if it's done in the master deed of the bylaws, because of this, um, uh, of this statute that requires you to use a 75% um, supermajority in order to uh, adopt something like that. Um, it, you would just have to separately sort of certify that you've achieved that amount and keep good records. Uh, I would recommend that it be done in the master deed uh, because that's uh, where the higher threshold is typically found. But as long as, as you recognize that that has a, a higher statutory requirement of approval than everything else, uh, that's the only thing that makes it more difficult. Writing it up is very easy. You know, it's my, my job on that is, is not the hard part. The hard part is the politics of getting that many people and to to improve it thank you all right uh, that about wraps it up i want to thank our presenters and all and everyone in attendance please feel free to email the chapter with any follow-up questions and i will pass them on uh, to our speakers thank you so much thank you thank have you. a great day bye, -bye.